Well, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 11. We're going to be continuing our series there. I have four kids, and I've only left one one time. My oldest, about 12 or 13, he was playing soccer, and it was a pretty typical thing where I thought Brooke had gotten him from practice, but she had politely reminded me that I was the one that was supposed to get him from practice. And so it was the fall, end of October, November. It was dark, about 8 p.m. I'm racing into the parking lot next to the soccer fields, and I see this little tiny figure in the darkness that looked like my son. So I pull up, put it in the park. He gets in the, in, the, in the truck, and he asks me one question. So do I get a phone now? <laughs> and sheepishly, I said, yes, son. Yes, you do. I didn't show up when I should have. Do you ever feel like God doesn't show up when he should have? There been moments in time in your life where something took place and you just asked yourself, where is God in this? Maybe you prayed for some situation and you prayed earnestly, pleading, hoping, needing something, and it appeared that God was silent. You know, our faith is really challenged. Maybe the It's never challenged more than we're experiencing a season of disappointment, suffering, and loss. Maybe you didn't get the promotion at work, or maybe worse, you lost your job. Maybe your friends are all getting married and you're still single. Maybe your kids are failing you and not meeting your expectations. Maybe your health took a significant turn. Maybe someone close to you has passed away or lost or moved away. Maybe your marriage is falling apart and divorce seems imminent. Your response is this, God, I don't understand. How can this be part of your plan? Listen, when life stinks, how do we respond? But this very issue of disappointment takes place here in John chapter 11, and I want us to kind of look into this space in a sermon titled, Glory Over Grief, Responding to Life's Disappointments. And so with that in mind, I'd like us to turn to John chapter 11, and we're going to start in verses 1 through 3. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, whom you love is ill. It's a pretty simple backdrop of what's taking place here. Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus are all living in Bethany. Lazarus becomes ill, but they don't name Lazarus as they talk to Jesus about him. The one whom you love, he is ill. Now, I know what they're hoping here. They've seen Jesus perform miracle upon miracle to to strangers and people who are sick. And so I think the hope here is that Jesus would heal their brother, Lazarus, verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, for it is the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be, be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, this just doesn't make a lot of sense here. We've established the fact that Jesus loves this very precious family. In fact, he says he loved not only Lazarus, but certainly Mary and Martha. No doubt how close he was to this family. But the response that Jesus gives them is pretty unique. And it's unique in a couple of ways. One, he says that that Lazarus is not going to die. I know you're concerned, but don't worry, he's not going to die. In fact, he's sick for the glory of God. And then secondly, he says, hey, and by the way, I'm going to stay two more days. I don't know about you, but if, if, if someone says, hey, I'm deathly ill, I want to go to them immediately. In fact, when I'm sick, if I have a cold or a flu, I feel like the world should stop and attend to my needs. I'm a big old baby when it comes to being sick. Jesus does something unique here. He says, I'm going to stay two more days. It doesn't make much sense. Verse 11. So after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to waken him. Now the disciples are thinking, well, Lord, if he's asleep, won't he just wake up on his own? Seems pretty simple. It's almost as if the disciples are like, hey, Jesus has kind of lost it here. We got one up on Jesus. Hey, Jesus, as he is asleep, he's going to wake up. And then in verse 14, Jesus told them plainly. Now I need you to, to read that as if Jesus rolled his eyes and said, Lazarus has died. He was teaching them, hey, that death for the believer is not eternal. But in this moment, physically, Lazarus has died. 
It's interesting here what Jesus is doing and how he's setting up this story. Verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb four days. It's interesting here because the Jews believed that the spirit of a dead person would remain in and around that body up to three days in the hopes of being uh, revived or resuscitated. But it's unique here that Jesus says it was four days Lazarus had been dead. In other words, Lazarus is dead dead. He's not a little dead. He's not barely dead. He is dead dead. He has been on the road many days dead. He is roadkill that's been soaked in the sun. He is dead dead. Now, that's a visual you can't get out of your mind. But hear me, this is what's going on as Jesus is describing what's taking place in this story. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, as we read this verse, there's a couple of things here that I think are important. The language by which John writes this account, I think, brings and helps us to understand kind of the gravity and the grave nature of what she says. Lord, if you had been here, it's almost as if she's accusing Jesus. If you had been here, my brother, in other words, it's not just the fact that Lazarus has died, but you pained me, my brother would not have died. In fact, he'd still be living. It's you, Jesus, who are the reason that he is dead. Pain, suffering, disappointment. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Verse 32. Now when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have they laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus understands our disappointments. When life hands you lemons, how do you make lemonade? When he hands you pain and crisis and death and divorce and cancer, how do we make sense of it? How should we respond to life's disappointments? Jesus provides for us, I think, in this narrative, three very simple answers to help us gain glory, help us gain a reality where Jesus is in the midst of doing something unique for his mission and his purpose. How do we respond? Notice that Mary and Martha both respond to Jesus' arrival the very same way. They both say the very same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my mother would not have died. And although they say the same thing, Jesus responds to them uniquely differently. His first answer to Martha is, number one, a theological answer. A theological answer that serves her head. Verse 23, your brother, he says, as a response, will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, what does this theological answer mean? Jesus is stating, whoever believes in me, though he die, he will live, and everyone who believes in me will never die. He's stating that Lazarus won't just rise again because Jesus is the power to, to, to raise him up, but he'll rise because Jesus is the resurrection. He is power over death, and those who believe in him will have power over death as well. Uniquely for the book of John are these I am statements. Jesus is describing who he is for the purpose of helping others believe in him, not only in him as salvation, but in him as the son of God. And so far, we've kind of walked through these I am statements as we've been in the book of John these last couple of weeks. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread, reminds us that he has the power to provide. John chapter 8, he says, I am the light, means he has the power to guide us. John chapter 10, he says, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. He has the power to bring us salvation. And here in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He's here to bring us power over life. But our hope as believers, listen, is not in an event of the resurrection, but our hope as believers is in a person named Jesus. Jesus isn't just saying, I have the power to do these things. He is saying, I am these things. I am your provider. I am your guide. I am your light. I am your way to salvation. I am your power over death, your giver of life, your resurrection. You see, the theological answer to our pain is that God is God, and God has always had power over life, power over all things in the universe, Theologically, we call this God's providence, God's sovereignty. Let me give it to you in layman's terms. God is always in control. That's the theological answer because it's the nature of God to be in control. This answer should serve our head. We know that God is in control. We heard that little Christian quip our entire life. God's in control, God's in control, God's in control. We as believers believe as creator God, Not only did he create creation, but he has control over all creation. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and following. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. God is in control. Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. So we know the providence of God. We believe in God's sovereignty, that he has the control and the ability to manage the entire universe, and not only situations over there, but situations right here. He has the power over every situation, including the power over death. God's answer to her disappointment is this, don't worry, I got this under control. I am the resurrection and the life. Your brother will rise. So in the midst of pain, how do we apply this theological answer? Well, if God has power over death, he's got power over your situation as well. Be reminded today in your head, in your knowledge, be fully understand the truth that God is in control over your financial crisis, over your kids' bad mistakes, over your addictions, over your hurting marriage, God has power over your failing health, over your grief, over your unmet expectations. Know this, church, that God is in control. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a pretty typical answer from a preacher. God's in control. Yes, sir, he is all the time. And in the midst of that, we begin to try to unravel this problem of evil. Well, if God is in control then, why do bad things happen to good people? And I won't take the time today to unravel the problem of evil, but I will say this, that our good God is always in control even when bad things happen to good people. We have this presupposition that good people shouldn't have anything bad to them or that only bad people deserve bad things to happen to them. And that's not the case at all. The scripture reminds us just how bad all of us are. The scripture says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. We are all under the curse of death, whether we're good or bad. Whatever in your mind where you constitute, I'm a good person, therefore bad things shouldn't happen to me. Let me just set the record straight. We are not good. And the Bible says that. We're all in great need. We are all dead in our trespass. But God, who is rich in mercy, who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, He's the one who brings us salvation in life. And it's that grace by which we receive that makes us unified with him. Good people aren't shielded from bad things. God, by his grace, gives us peace and love and hope. He gives us roofs over our heads and people who love us and a church that we can celebrate in. God gives us a mission and a purpose. He graces us with all kinds of things in the midst of our cancer in the midst of our heart attacks, in the midst of our pain and suffering and loss and disappointment, God's grace is there. We live in a broken world and that brokenness bleeds over into our lives, sometimes wildly unexpectedly. So wherever you are for the believer, just be reminded that in the midst of your sting, 
God has taken the sting out of death, and he's given us life, even in the midst of suffering. So in every seemingly random bad thing, he, listen, is working out his redemptive story through you. This is why Paul says in Romans 8 that all things work together for the good of those that love God. This is why in Ephesians chapter 1, we're reminded that we are to, to, to be thoughtful that he is working out all things according to the counsel of his will. And our response is to be of him praise to his glory. This is why Joseph in the Old Testament, after having many committing grave injustices against him, said, listen, what you meant for evil, God repurposed for good. God is in control. That's his response to Martha. What about his response to Mary? Well, if Martha gets a theological answer, Mary gets a psychological answer. And the intent is to serve her heart. Jesus sees Mary weeping. The people who come with her are weeping. And Jesus' response is, Scripture says he is deeply moved and he is greatly troubled. And and that results in Jesus weeping. This intentionally emotional response is pretty incredible. It may be the most human thing we see Jesus do in all the scriptures. Deeply moved, greatly troubled. When you put those phrases together, it's this idea that Jesus was disturbed, even agitated, seeing and hearing so much pain, and it intensely bothered him. He was distraught by all of it, and the response is brokenness. Jesus wept literally means Jesus burst into tears. Have you ever had pain in your life where you had no words and all you could do was shed tear? You know, verse 36 may be the most shortest verse in all the Bible, but it it carries incredible weight for the believer. Jesus knows our pain. He understands how our heart aches. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. What that means is he was fully God and fully human. He understands disappointment. He understands pain. He certainly understands suffering. Jesus understands how it feels to be abandoned, how it feels to be disappointed by those who don't rise up to the occasion and the expectations that he has for them. Jesus understands what it means to be lied about. Jesus gets us. Jesus, as God, is fully human. Jesus weeping reminds us that he is not unaware and he is wildly sympathetic to our issue. So how do we apply this psychological answer that Jesus knows us, Jesus loves us? Well, one, be aware that he understands your pain. You may think, no one knows what I'm going through. Can I just tell you, Jesus Jesus knows. No one feels what I feel. Let Let me just back up a second. He does. He does. And he knows, and he loves, and he cares. I think the second thing we can apply is just this reminder of what Jesus is doing in the midst of this story. He is modeling for us how we are to be compassionate to those who are hurting. You know, Romans 12, 15 says, weep with those who weep. And that's exactly what Jesus does. It's remarkable that the Son of God, here in a moment, is going to take away their pain. Their tears of of sadness are going to be tears of joy here in just a few verses. But before he fixes their problem, he joins their pain. He enters their grief before he exiles it. Now, why is that? I think he's reminding them and modeling for us that when people around us hurt, we need to hurt with them. We need to hurt with them. And as a community of faith, if you've got people in your small group, your Sunday school, or even in a greater way, your neighborhood or your community that you know are hurting, reach out. Don't just ignore and go, well, I really hate it for them. Bless their heart. Bless their heart by by sitting with them, writing a note. Be in their pain with them. That's what it means to be a community of faith, helping those who are hurting, helping those who are in heartache. Well, there's a greater narrative going on than just just Lazarus dying and, and, and then coming back to life. Jesus 
is on mission. There is a missiological answer here that serves the soul. That's a big word that I might have just made up. But the truth is, there's a study of mission. And we as believers need to study the mission of God. In the midst of pain, in the midst of disappointment, Jesus is on mission here. And so let us not miss this answer because I think it's wildly important. When I was seven, I got a microscope. And I was going to say I got my first microscope, but let's be honest, it was my only microscope, okay? And it probably cost 20 bucks, I don't know, it wasn't very great, but I remember thinking I was going to grab everything I could to look under the microscope. So I grabbed some carpet and some paper, grabbed my hair, my dog's hair, uh, grabbed some dirty water and some insects, and man, I was all about that microscope. I chased my twin sister around with a bobby pin, hoping I could prick her to get her blood so I could look at it. I wasn't going to prick myself, I was going after hers. I was always looking for something to put under that microscope. There's a whole world happening beyond the naked eye that I couldn't see. And I think the same could be said for us today. We only see what we can see. Isaiah 55 reminds us we can't see what God sees. We can't know what God knows. We don't know what's happening underneath some stuff, but God does. Our lives are being lived with limitations, and all the while, behind our circumstances and beyond our comprehension, God is at work fulfilling his purpose and his mission. He is accomplishing his mission through the death of Lazarus. Now, that is going to mean that some people are going to hurt as a result of that, but God is at work. Let's pick up the story in verse 38. When Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by, by this time, there will be an odor. In the King James, it says he stinketh. <laughs> That's not true, by the way. For he has been dead four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say to this on account of the people standing around that they may believe. There's that word that's key to the whole book of John. They may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who died, came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Now listen, if this were a movie, there'd be a, a giant musical score. The crowds would be cheering. Mary and Martha would be embracing. But listen, the victory here is not that Lazarus has rose from the dead. The victory here is that many believed in Jesus. Amen. And Jesus points to this victory throughout the entire story. And if, and if we forget that Jesus is on mission in the story, in the narrative, we're going to forget that Jesus is on mission in our life as well. Let's look back, verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death, for it is the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 14 and 15, Lazarus has died for your sake. I am glad that I was not there, that you may believe. Verse 40, Jesus said to Martha, did I not tell you if you believed, you'd be, see the glory of God. In verse 42, Jesus prays that the crowd may believe. And in verse 45, to me, this is the, the moment of the entire story. The Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did, and they believed in him. Listen, mission accomplished. Jesus was on mission, and he knew the mission. He knew it was going to require some pain and cause some heartache those, to those who were dear to him and near to him. But there was something much larger at work beyond Mary and Martha's desire, even beyond Lazarus's life. There's a grand story unfolding throughout humanity, and it may bring pain and suffering, and disappointment, and grief, and loss. But in reality, can we just recognize and have comfort knowing that your pain may have a purpose? That God may be at work in the midst of what's going on 
with you. I don't know your story, but God does. And I just challenge you to be thoughtful of the mission of God around you. I know families after family after family who've lost loved ones. And the question is, why did this take place? And my answer is, I don't know. And we may not know this side of heaven, but I know this. God loves you. God's caring for you. He understands your pain and heartache. And it could be that God's going to use your story for his glory. You know, as believers, it's really hard to not let our, our faith be managed by our feelings. It's difficult because we are a people that feel. And when your feelings overstep your faith, I think it's on a downhill slide to failure. If you're feeling today, if you're in pain and heartache and loss and grief, listen, be reminded of the faith that you have in the Lord who is in control. Be reminded that God knows your pain and your suffering. And be thoughtful that God is on mission in the midst of what may be happening in your life. How do we apply this missiological answer? Well, one, Jesus is always on mission. And what is his mission? To seek and save that which is lost. I got a question for you this morning. Are you lost today? Do you know Christ as your savior? Because it could be that God's been on mission in your life drawing you to himself. And it's one of the reasons that you're here. It's one of the reasons maybe you've got a relationship uh, with a friendship or, or some kind of an acquaintance with someone here. Maybe you're invited here. Maybe you're seeking out some answers in your life, and you know this, that you've never trusted Christ with your sin. You've never invited him to be Lord of your life. Can I just tell you, God's on mission, and his mission is that you would be saved today. And that's how you apply that. Here in just a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, we're going to have some pastors down here at the front, we're going to have some pastors in the back, pastors in the balcony, and I just invite you, if you don't know Christ, go, go find one of those pastors and just say, hey, I, I'd like to know how to be saved. And they'll just spend some time with you. Maybe you want to ask that question to someone that you brought, that brought you here today, or someone that you know. Listen, we want to make it easy for you, but you've got to, you've got to take that step of, of courage and boldness and seek out the grace that Jesus offers through his son, Jesus. Another way to apply it is simply this, is to be thoughtful of your feelings in the midst of your, of your life and allowing those feelings not to overstep your faith. Because when they do, we begin to doubt and we begin to fear and we begin to have some anxiety and we begin to allow some sin in our life in the midst of our angers. And so in your feelings, Continue to have faith, and as you do that, the Lord will sustain you. He will hold you, and he will certainly keep you. And it may feel like in your circumstances, God has not shown up, that you, like my son, are standing in the dark waiting for him. But in the truth, can I just tell you, he's been there the whole time. Isaiah 42 is one of my favorite chapters of all the Bible, verses one through three. It just reminds us, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Listen, my favorite part is this. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God is with us. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did and believed in him. God, may our lives be part of your mission. Let us trust you when it hurts. And let us weep with those who weep, comfort those who need to be comforted. And may we as a people honor you and give you glory over our grief.